Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. We recently had our Climate Catastrophe Leadership event, and we're lucky enough to have Ezra Levant as our guest speaker. I'm delighted to have 450 people show up to hear me give a, a talk. I'm thrilled, thanks, and congratulations to the Friends of Science. I think I would give one uh, piece of advice, and that is, uh, although the global warming uh, theory the, man, the theory of man-made global warming is dominant. Uh, there are a large number of people who are skeptical of it. You, there's different layers of skepticism. You could be skeptical that the globe is warming. You could be skeptical that it's caused by man. You could be skeptical that we could do anything about it. You could be skeptical that we should do anything about it. And you could be skeptical how to do something about it. You could be skeptical that the people who are promoting a solution actually believe it. I mean, does anyone look at Al Gore and say, there's a guy who's really reduced his carbon footprint? So my point is, you don't have to feel alone. A, a lot of people will give the fashionable cocktail party answer, oh yeah, I believe in global warming. But when they know it's okay to speak candidly, if you lead, I think you'll find a lot of people who say, yeah, I'm a bit skeptical too. That's the thing about a perpetual revolution, a perpetual calamity, the sky's going to fall. That's the thing about saying we only have six months to clean up the, cli uh, the climate, we only have six years. You know, these people have been in this business for so long, each one of their deadlines has come and gone. So I, I guess I would prescribe courage and say that speaking out and speaking back and not turtling uh, but rather fighting back, that's my advice, is, is these guys are just paid professional lobbyists and they're very effective, very powerful. But I believe that grassroots real Canadians could be more powerful because there's more of us and we're actually Canadian unlike these foreign funded saboteurs. So I see this tweet by Tom Moffat the uh, former Alberta NDP candidate, former NDP candidate down in Lethbridge. He sees the forest fire where you and I see tragedy, where we see danger. He sees, well, he sees a moment to gloat in glee. He says, karmic climate change fire burns Canadian oil sand city. Feel the burn. Could you imagine writing that? You're an Albertan. Feel the burn. I, I love how he invokes karma, which is, you know, about Zen and... Stay, but he, he is gloating in glee for danger. Thank God no one died in the evacuation, at least in those early days. He was rejoicing in the suffering. It's really a religious fervor. There's a quasi-religiousness. That's sort of a mishmash of Eastern religions. And, you know, it's, but it's more superstition than religion. It's post-religious. It's really, though, an anthropomorphism. Oh, this was a moral punishment by Gaia of people in Fort McMurray. It's sort of like a burn the witch. You know, these people are evil, and the proof of it is the fire. Uh, he's not a nobody. That's him on the left there uh, with Brian Mason, uh, the transport minister, and on the right there, Shannon Phillips, the environment minister. So he's not some fringe wacko. Well, I mean, any more than the other NDP are. <laughs> he's connected to cabinet. He's an NDP activist. And his apology was an ironic apology, as in, I'm sorry you were so upset. I'm so he actually told the CBC, I'm sorry I was misinterpreted. Oh, Tom, you're right. It's our fault. But Tom Moffat was not alone. He was expressing what most on the left felt. Most had the common sense or courtesy to shut up just for the first 24 hours or so. Not Tom, but here's another one. Here's the US funded Dogwood Initiative. It's a little blurry because it was deleted. He deleted it uh, when he got the phone call from his boss, but I'll read it. It says, Justin Trudeau, still want more pipelines? Fort Murray wildfires intensify. Climate change, keep it in the ground. So people are fleeing for his, their lives, but he sees opportunity. Because you know, there weren't forest fires before the pipelines. Actually, it's not even pipelines, because the pipelines are, this guy's trying to be against pipelines, and that's why the, I don't quite understand it, but he was linking pipelines with forest fires with the tragedy, and he was just high-fiving everyone. Um, 
Dogwood Initiative funded by U.S. donors, uh, very active in the uh, Anyone But Harper campaign, which did polling in local ridings and saying, hey, if you're in this riding, the NDP have a better chance. If you're in this riding, the Liberals have a chance. So that's the voice of the U.S. funded left. Um, this guy had to take his tweet down because his bosses knew it was just too much. But here's the Sierra Club, Fort Mac Fire. It is a disaster that is very related to the global climate crisis. They didn't take this down because they believe it. They believe it. Sierra Club Foundation is a registered charity with the CRA. They also take foreign funding. But look, it's not just them. I mean, here's Elizabeth May announcing that Canada must slash fossil fuel consumption to prevent events like the Fort McMurray fire. You know, forest fires were around before cars, just so you know. Um, but mass evacuations of 60,000, 70,000 people in one day without an incident, that wasn't around before cars. Cars saved lives, fossil fuels saved lives in Fort McMurray. <laughs> but it's a new, it's sort of a, uh, I mean these people invoking karma, invoking Gaia, you know, these are the evidence-based scienticians, I'll have you know. And you know Elizabeth May has got her science rock solid. I went through her Twitter feed. Um, here's here's a, a keeper. It is very disturbing how quickly Wi-Fi has moved into schools, as it is children who are the most vulnerable. Maybe the Wi-Fi caused the forest fires? This is your evidence-based environmentalism. Here she is again, interesting and informative session on electromagnetic frequencies and smart meters. So glad I don't have Wi-Fi at home. <laughs> I'm sorry, she's a kook. This is, this is real. This, I, I literally took a screenshot of this today. This is Elizabeth May. There you go. But you know, there, there actually is some science about forest fires. Um, after the arson in Slave Lake, I think it was the most costly arson in Canadian history. It burnt the town close to a billion dollars in damage. The province said, well, what went wrong there? And they published this report. Um, how can you stop a forest fire? How can you protect a city? A billion dollars went up in smoke, and that's just the financial cost, there's the human cost. So the province investigated, and they published this report in 2013. And, um, you know, the number one rule was if you build a city in the middle of a forest, have a fire break. Don't have this city right up to the forest. You're in the largest forest in Canada, the northern boreal forest. It is so massive, you can lose a, an extra hundred feet of forest. And that's really their number one piece of advice. Um, but uh, the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, which is what the municipality in Fort McMurray, they knew this, they saw this, they are surrounded by forests. That's the thing for everyone here who's been to Fort McMurray, uh, no matter how you arrive, and I usually fly in, as most people do, I think, you are overwhelmed by the size of the forest. I mean, it is surrounded by forests and streams and rivers. And, and when you come in, especially if all you knew about Fort McMurray was what you see on the CBC, you expect it to look like something out of the land of Mordor. But it's actually a gorgeous little city hiking, fishing, you know, so many, and it's, it's a forest town, and the forest comes right up to it. But the eco-activists have, have so denatured the thinking in that city that even Fort McMurray's own political leaders have infused themselves with sort of eco-fashions. They know that oil is, has built, is building, will build that city, but they have the affectations of the environmentalists who attack them. I mean, I, I was up there uh, after they brought in the plastic bag ban. You know, you go to Max, you have plastic, they don't give you plastic bags. You gotta bring your hippie hemp rope bag in, you know, <laughs> which I carry around with me. And uh, so it's no problem for me, guys like me. But, okay, so you're sitting on 170 billion barrels of oil, but, but you think that not giving me a bag at 7-Eleven is going to buy the love of Greenpeace. And they're gonna stop campaigning against you because you won't give me a plastic bag. Well, yeah, that kind of goofy eco-stunt thinking 
it's not just for Vancouverites and Torontonians, it is in Fort McMurray. And I show you, uh, for example, this document, the Highway 63 Area Structure Plan. Look at some of the advice. So I just told you that the worst arson fire in Canadian history, a billion dollars damage, Slave Lake, the province said, number one thing, clear your forests from around your cities. Don't worry, there's plenty more trees. Well, what does uh, Fort McMurray say? Natural tree planting to screen industrial development along the corridor. Because that's good for ecotourism, I swear to God. You're, in, you're sitting on 170 billion barrels of oil. No one goes up there for ecotourism. If you're going up there for oil, maybe you'll do some tourism too. But no one is saying, I want to go ecotouring. I hear there's some really nice trees next to the, next to the plant. I'm not even kidding. I read this document. They talk about ecotourism and scenic drives. And so their advice is have natural tree buffers right next to the road. Maybe we will get green tourism. Yeah, yeah. Good idea, guys. Um, it's not just that. They're actual development by law. They're by law. So you got the, the Slave Lake advice, which is chop down trees around your cities. Around, your, around anything you want to save, really, from a forest fire, drop the trees down from around there. Um, but the development bylaw sort of says the opposite. Uh, issue, preservation of natural wildlife and fish habitat. Our direction, 5.5.6, ensuring to the greatest extent possible that natural features of development sites, trees, vegetation, wetlands, etc., are not removed or filled. You are in the largest forest in North America. And you, and you are ordered for reasons of natural wildlife preservation to have trees right next to your, to your residential areas. That doesn't even make any sense. But the Wi-Fi and Gaia tell me. <laughs> Look, there actually are some real reasons why the city burned. The forest fires are natural, although in this case it may be arson as well. But here's a story by Don Braid. April 21st, he published it, called NDP Cuts Firefighting Budget While Predicting Catastrophic Conditions. And you know this story by now. Last year, the province spent half a billion dollars fighting fires. This year, the budget was, what, 86 million. Uh, contracts with water bombers were literally being canceled last month. It's the one thing they found to save money on in this budget. Biggest budget deficit in history, biggest tax raise, biggest tax take in history, biggest spending in history. But the one thing they thought they'd save money on was the fire insurance. And the thing about water bombers is you got to pay them to be on call for you. And God willing, you never need them. But if you don't pay them, then they'll be on call for someone else who pays them, or they'll go to an air show or whatever. Rachel Notley chose this issue to save money on. Last year's budget, half a billion. This year's 86 million. Look, it wasn't Wi-Fi or karma. It was nature and the fact that no one followed the rules of Slave Lake and the firefighters were not on standby or budgeted for and now Justin Trudeau says we don't need help from outside the country either. Got it. Look, there is no dividing line in Canada anymore between those radical activists like the Dogwood Initiative and the political leaders. Here's a story from back when Rachel Notley was the leader of the opposition. She had Greenpeace activists in her staff go and do hooliganism at conservative oil fundraisers. You know, there, there's just no, there's no blurring, there's no line dividing where the eco-activists end and where she begins. Some of you have seen this video. I've, I've played about three of these vids for you before if you were at our town hall in the summer. Forgive me for playing them again. Here's Rachel Notley when she was in opposition. Listen to how she talks about uh, some ducks. I mean, what this tragedy represents is a great deal of pain and suffering to the Dutch, but also it represents the um, inherent um, conflict that exists between unbridled industrial growth that is con conflicted with um, uh, environmental protection,
health protection and community protection. Okay, well maybe she was just talking about the tragedy of the ducks and things like that when she was in opposition. But no, as Premier, she has not wavered. Here, listen to her talk about what you and I call crude oil. She's renamed it. She thought, well, we've, we've, got to say, we've got to call it something uglier than crude oil because we want to get people, you know, uh, disgusted with the key industry of the province. So listen to her. This is after she was elected now as Premier. The, our position on the Keystone was that if we ship uh, unprocessed bitumen to Texas, according to this government and to the American government, we will give tens of thousands of Alberta jobs to Texas, not to Alberta. So she's against exporting raw, unprocessed bitumen. That sounds so gross. No, that, that's, that's crude oil. And that's what we do every day by the million of barrels. But you can see there two things. First of all, the lie that Rachel Notley supports pipelines. That pipeline there was approved by the National Energy Board in Canada. But she's against it. So she's against a pipeline that was approved for which there are no objections along the route to a customer who buys uh, you know, millions of barrels of, actually hundreds of millions of barrels of oil a year from us. She was against it because it would export jobs. So without pipelines, we're gonna keep all these jobs here or something. It, it doesn't make sense, but it doesn't have to make sense. As long as you have an excuse for the moment. I, I wanna show you the chief of staff, I only want to show two more videos about who her team is, because I know some of you have seen these before. But my case is that the radicals, the haters, the, the superstitious pagan earth cult post-Christian weirdos who are saying this was karma, they are not outside the legislature shouting in. They are in the premier's office. Listen to this, and can you tell me the difference between this little tirade by Brian Topp, the Chief of Staff, brought in from Toronto, Chief of Staff, can you tell the difference between this and the LEAP Manifesto? Whoops, I'm having some trouble here. We want a, we want a clear approach on climate change, and I, I quite like what they're doing in Europe, and it's worth studying, studying it carefully as we think about Canadian policy. Hard cap on emissions to price carbon, a home and industrial retrofit program, getting out of coal, getting an urban mass transit program, and getting fossil fueled cars out of our cities. The comprehensive approach like that, we can tackle climate change, and it's got to be at the heart of our next government. Well, check, 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 check. The only thing he hasn't done yet is get fossil fuel cars out of our cities. I'd say Brian Top has been a great success. Um, OK, just, just one more video. Here's David Egan, the cabinet minister, before he was in cabinet. This is him in opposition. Just take a listen. Balance of mind, balance of body starts by doing the right thing. And I say that doing the right thing means that we have no new approvals for tar sand projects. Yeah. And we start to invest money into a renewable energy and into a sustainable economy. Yeah. No new approvals. No Chanting like children, no argument, no possibility of being convinced because it's just a chant. It's like chanting a mantra. He's for no new approvals. He's in cabinet with Rachel Notley, with Shannon Phillips, with Brian Topp as the chief of staff. Do you think that this, do you think that a lifelong activist like David Egan, like Brian Topp, uh, a lifelong activist like Rachel Notley, whose father was a lifelong activist, do you think they've changed? Do you think they've changed their mind? Do you think that someone who would chant like a child, no new approvals, is suddenly for the oil sands, for pipelines? Rachel Notley has told you the answer. She's against pipelines. She even had that line since becoming premier. <laughs> the chanting, these are the science-based policy folks. But look, it's not just in Alberta anymore. Here is Gerald Butts, the right hand and the left hand man, to Justin Trudeau talking about wanting to end the fossil fuel economy. We think that the oil sands have been expanded too rapidly uh, uh, without a serious plan for environmental remediation in the first place. So that's why we don't think it's up to us to decide whether there should be another, another route for a pipeline. 
because uh, the real alternative is not an alternative route, it's an alternative comment. Just stop and think about that. Not an alternative route, so you cannot convince him that it's, it's not about this way or that way or this river or that one or this land. It's not about the details. Don't, don't be tricked into thinking there's some, you know, if we just have a longer review, if we just, that there's a way out. You heard him. He wants an alternative economy. Oh, just that. What's an economy? Well, that's how we all live and work and interact with each other. It's really the essence of a, of a couple. We'll just have an alternative economy. It's just that. Just that. Here he is again. And, and listen, um, and, and uh, I just want to remind you that Gerald Butts, before he was Justin Trudeau's right-hand man, he was for um, Dalton McGuinty, the Premier of Ontario, who brought in that province's Green Energy Act. Uh, take a listen here. But the, north, the route for the Northern Gateway is directly through the last intact temperate rainforest on Earth. Um, it, uh, and that's just the, the pipeline infrastructure, the much bigger environmental risk, of course, is the tanker traffic that would go uh, in and out of the Great Bear, Bear Sea um, uh, two, three hundred times a year. And we just don't, I don't think that there's a plan in place to mitigate this risk. So uh, we ought not to be talking about how we accelerate the discussion more we ought to be talking about uh, the bigger picture issue of the national energy strategy and why are we in such a rush to extract this resource in the first place. And, and to date, the national discussion on energy has almost been entirely circumscribed around fossil fuels. Uh, and uh, we have abundant sources of geothermal, solar, wind, hydro energy uh, that aren't part of that conversation. So it ought to be more balanced. One. Are you in any doubt you in any doubt where he stands. He has a track record of giving Ontario the highest power prices in North America. And, but look at his criticisms there. He criticizes tankers and pipelines on the West Coast. But when was the last time any liberal ever criticized tankers and pipelines on the Atlantic Coast? Uh, the city where he's from, Montreal, is fed in part, and it certainly was more so until Line 9 was reversed, by the Portland to Montreal pipeline, which is about 70 years old, which pumps hundreds of thousands of barrels a day from OPEC tankers that disgorge in Portland, Maine, into Montreal. Um, do they not run the risk of leaking? Is that pipeline, a 70-year-old pipeline, as good as the state-of-the-art one proposed for Northern Gateway? Why do we never hear criticisms of OPEC tankers inbound with Sharia oil, but only ethical oil tankers that would be outward bound? Why is that? Why do all these eco, when was the last time Greenpeace ever criticized, let alone protested, Saudi Arabia or Iran or Venezuela? I've never seen it. But those countries are far larger than Canada is. But he's talking about moving off of fossil fuels and into geothermal. Can you imagine the cost of his schemes? I can imagine it because I live in exile in Ontario and I pay the power prices out there. It's, it, it seriously is, is not, not much uh, less than rent, for, uh, depending, on, depending on your house. Um, but does he mean it? Does he mean it? Here is the Unabomber's shack. Um, but those are plastic jugs in the attic. I don't think these environmental extremists truly mean it. I know some vegans, I'm, they call themselves vegans, I like to say, I'm very open-minded that way, I'm very tolerant, so I know some people who don't eat meat, and I have no problem with them. Um, you know, this is 2016. But if someone was an anti-meat activist, while they were chomping on a big chicken wing, I'd say, well, what are you not, you're not even, you know, but do you know a single anti-oil activist who doesn't jet around, who doesn't drive around, who doesn't use the industrial age, who doesn't tweet and Facebook and use a computer? It would, I mean, Al Gore flies either first class or private jet. He sold current TV to Al Jazeera, which is owned by the OPEC dictatorship of Qatar. How can you claim you're against fossil fuels 
When, when you live as large as they do, David Suzuki co-owns a property with an oil company. How can these people, have, even the Unabomber didn't actually mean it when he said he wanted off of oil. Now there are some people who mean it. I got this chart from something called a transition town plan. Now, until about a year ago, transition town, that was before Bruce Jenner sort of changed the meaning of that word. <laughs> a transition town was a place where all the would-be Unabombers would go and they would get ready to de-industrialize on purpose. And there's sort of a millennial cult. This is their chart, not mine. And this is the mind of a deep green eco-radical. They, it's, a, it's actually a brilliant chart, isn't it? Look at it. You can see over time, they say the industrial era, we population and energy and resource use was going up, 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 up. And we're right at that turning point. And they say those of us who believe that we can continue to grow are techno-fantasists. And that's a wonderful word, isn't it? But it is true. I mean, fracking unlocked uh, heretofore useless tiny little droplets of gas and rock. The oil sands was useless until technology made that fantasy a reality. So I think techno-fantasy is, you know, it's meant as an insult, but it's actually technology and freedom is fantastic. But they think Fort McMurray is unrealistic. It's a techno-fantasy. They think that those who believe in wind turbines and solar panels, they call that green tech stability, but they think those people are just bargaining with their grief. They think that if we do not take the creative descent, what they call a permaculture, by deindustrializing and going a little bit more caveman, if we do not choose to degrow, to personally reduce, reuse, and recycle our own lives, that we will have a Mad Max, there, it's a beautiful, it's a great chart, that we will have a Mad Max type collapse. This is an ideology, it's a cult, it's a post-Christian apocalyptic vision, and there are believers in this. But there's also a lot of people like Gerald Butts who talk this way, but live the techno-fantasy life, private jets, high carbon use. The thing is, he's not living it. He believes it because it's easy to believe in something that makes you rich. It's easy to sell something that is bought. And here's an example. This is just one example. Believe me, I could show you a dozen. This is the Hewlett Foundation from the computer innovator of that same name. And this shocking document shows a uh, $100 million one-year grant. And this was a five-year, $500 million grant. Imagine that. Imagine one single foundation in one single year. And there are, I, I mean, I can name other foundations, but this is just so amazing to see it on their own website. $100 million bucks for anti-carbon Propaganda, anti, they call it climate works, anti-carbon lobbying, anti-carbon journalism, anti-carbon organizing. So you can talk like the Unabomber, but live like David Suzuki. Because the money closes the, it closes the gap there. It's easy to believe in something that makes you rich. If you're a professor at the university, you'll get tenure and a grant if you say this. If you say that, you won't. If you're a journalist, you'll be labeled a, an eccentric, contrarian, conspiracy theorist kook if you're a skeptic, or you can join the consensus, and journalists are nothing if not a mob. Um, you can even get a degree in it. I mean, I, I just love showing this, and, and I, I actually punished myself by reading this. This is the master's thesis of an activist named Andrew Frank a few years back. At Simon Fraser University, he got a Master of Arts. And this is his thesis. Presenters of an inconvenient truth as intermediaries of environmental communication. What does that mean? He got an MA after his name, paid for by you and me, by doing a paper that was basically a battle plan for how to take Al Gore's 
PowerPoint presentation in an inconvenient truth and teach teachers, teach other people to go and replicate that presentation to Rotary Clubs, etc. So political campaigning, I get it, but paid for by taxpayers and getting a master's degree, do you think they even allow skeptics, climate skeptics at this university's department? Do you think they're even allowed? I, mean, I don't know how they grade master's degree, I don't think it's like an A, B, C, D, but do you think you would your thesis would be accepted or approved if you were a skeptic? If you did this for a climate depot or a, you know, a climate skeptics approach, do you think you would get your master's degree? Um, subsidized by taxpayers, of course, which is far more than the Hewlett Foundation can furnish. Sometimes uh, subsidized by our NATO allies. Here's an example from an access to information request to the UK Foreign Office the government of our friend and ally, the United Kingdom, was paying the Pembina Institute to come up with anti-oil sands actions. So a foreign country, by the way, that imports, I mean, I mean the, the, the North Sea oil is declining. They invest, let me put it that way, they invest in every despotic regime in the world. So the UK has no problem investing in every OPEC dictatorship, but they will spend money in Canada to have sock puppets attacking the oil sands because it would look more natural and organic than if some fellow from the High Commission would say, I do say. Those oils, you know what, I mean, we would say, well, you're our ally, why are you attacking us? So it was only through access to information. So we did, this is just open governments that will answer a question if you put it to them. Here's the Form 990, it's too small to look at. I'll just tell you, it's the, it's the disclosure of the Tides Foundation in San Francisco, $153 million a year spent on anti-oil sands and other left-wing causes. The Canadian branch plant of Tide spends about 25 million. These are the ones we know about because they're under disclosure requirements by the IRS, etc. cetera. Um, there are conspiracy theories on the left and the right, but you do not need a conspiracy theory when you're talking about anti-oil sands activists because sometimes conspiracies are a fact. They're not just a theory. You don't need conspiracy theories because the facts are damning enough. This is a document confirmed by its author as authentic called the Tar Sands Campaign. It was a campaign launched, as you can see, in New York by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. How ironic is that? In July 2008. Now, this is the cover title. I just wanted to show it to you. I'll skip ahead. 2008, I put it to you before 99% of Canadians had heard of the oil sands. I guess Albertans would. But they had mapped it out. This is, this is a slide from their slideshow. A globally significant threat. And look at the pipelines. Look at that. Now, this was when natural gas was still expensive. So you can see the proposed Mackenzie Valley pipeline. But even back then, they were focusing on the Keystone Excel and pipeline and refinery expansion. Look at this. The, the, Back in 2008, they were already listing tankers and the Northern Gateway Pipeline as a target. Did you even know about the Northern Gateway Pipeline in 2008? I don't think you did. But look at this. This is who was part of this project by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. This is sort of their logo page. Look at that, top right, World Wildlife Fund. That's the organization that Gerald Butts was the president of for years before he went to join Trudeau. Look uh, at the bottom right there, you can see the Pembina Institute. There's the Sierra Club, obviously Greenpeace, Force Ethics. These are the sock puppets, these are the front groups, some of them American, but some of them Canadian, to, to Canadianize the, this American intervention. And as you can see, it started out as a, as a, co a coalition between Rockefeller Brothers Fund and Hewlett Foundations, it started at $7 million a year. What's the budget of Friends of Science? Is it $7,000 a year? This one campaign was $7 million. They had a Canadian and a U.S. coordinator. And look at what the $7 million was for. Lawsuits. Lawsuits. And I told you that they had the sock puppets to Canadianize it, because these are billionaire foundations in New York. If they came up here, 
like the British High Commission and said, oh, you know, if they, if they had their Yankee draw, I'm not going to try and do a, a if, they, if they had their Bernie Sanders New York accent, I'm not going to try that. We would laugh them out and say, you know, Yankee, go home. But if they, look at this, First Nations and other legal challenges. Okay, so you were a white billionaire heir in New York. You came up to Canada and said, stop your oil sands, and your last name was Rockefeller? We'd sort of laugh and say, thanks, you can go home now. But they're smart, these Rockefellers. They inherited something from their father besides money. And so they know Canadianize it and Aboriginalize it. Call up central casting. Find an Aboriginal front, and you'll shut Canadians up because they don't want to be called racist. Now, this was a 2008 plan. It is almost exactly eight months since since they talked about blocking Mackenzie Valley, blocking Northern Gateway, blocking pipelines, blocking Keystone Excel. I'd say Rockefeller got his fun and money's worth, don't you? I, I think he exceeded, exceeded their plans. All right, flash forward to where we are now. Here's Al Gore. With actual attorneys general, when I first saw this story, I thought, who would hang out with this OPEC half billionaire? Like I say, he sold his TV channel, current TV, to Al Jazeera to become Al Jazeera America. This, the sticker price was four or five hundred million dollars. OPEC oil money. I thought, who would hang out with this discredited oil hack? I thought, these are retired attorneys. No, these are actual attorneys general who have announced that they are going to use lawfare to make malicious lawsuits against anyone who has a skeptical view to their official political position on global warming. And to criminalize skepticism, now the, every one of those lawsuits will fail. Unlike us, they have a strong First Amendment down there. But that's not the point. The process is the punishment, the demonization, of course. But taking time and money and hassle and stress and management time and scaring away the faint-hearted and scaring away don't, that's the plan. They know they won't convict anyone. It's still America and they still have free speech. But they will burn, they will use taxpayers' money to burn up conservative think tank money. They'll do that all day. Hey, do you think they're doing that in Canada? Now this is using taxpayers' money, but I showed you how Tide's foundation money, Tide's real specialty is donor anonymity. So a donor can make a huge gift to Tides Foundation in San Francisco, and Tides will then re-gift that money to Canada, but keep the original identity of the original donor secret. So when tens of millions of dollars pours into the anti-oil sands, anti-fracking movement in Canada, and it's from the Tides Foundation, well, that's like saying, uh, it, you know, well, it, it, that's who handed it over, but who gave the money in the first place? Well, we don't quite know. So when we see news that Andrew Weaver, who was a professor, an anti-oil science professor, now an MLA in British Columbia. What does he earn? Maybe $100,000 a year? Maybe $120,000 a year? He's not a rich man. He's not poor, but he's not rich. He sued the National Post in an extremely lengthy and costly lawsuit that could not have cost him less than $150,000 after tax dollars for defamation, for for criticisms that I, I was shocked the court found against them. But that's not the point. Let, let's say, I mean, again, f uh, First Amendment, we don't have it here. I'm not talking about the merits of the case. Don't tell me that a professor on a $100,000 pre-tax salary can afford a quarter million dollars of after-tax litigation. I'm sorry, I don't believe it. I do not believe it. Andrew Weaver will not, will not answer the question if his litigation is funded by a third party. What do you think? Which brings us to our host today, the Friends of Science. This billboard, one of several they put up, is being the subject of litigation. Do you think it should be illegal to have an opinion that is wrong? Well, the thing about opinions, they're not wrong. They're either reasonable or unreasonable, but they're not right or wrong. But is this, a, is this an illegal opinion or an illegal fact? Are, are we in a place now where either of those things could be called illegal? To have a bill, even if the fact was wrong, this is an opinion. This is an opinion, or it's a fact, I don't care which it is. In what world would either interpretation of this be illegal? Well, enter eco-justice, funded by U.S. foundations, running a letter, in this case, to the commissioner of the Competition Bureau, 
asking for an investigation of the Friends of an investig a government investigation of the Friends of Sciences, the Friends of Science for that billboard. U.S. money. Hey, I got a question for you. If the NRA funded some nuisance suit against Canadian anti-gun activists, do you think that just might make it in the national news and the CBC, Toronto Star, Globe and Mail? Here we have foreign funds sloshing into Canada by the tens of million to file nuisance suits against Canadian citizens, and it's, it's just a peep. I, I said before we can find out about some of this through some government transparency laws, access to information, uh, IRS, but what about countries that don't have that kind of transparency? Like for example, OPEC countries. Let me show you my favorite example. This is a tweet you can find online right now. I don't know if you can read it. Um, you know that movie Gasland? It was sort of the seminal anti-fracking propaganda film. It was nominated for an Oscar uh, in 2011 and it didn't win. Now I saw that movie and I, I read the credits of it and nowhere in the credits did it say it was produced with the cooperation of Venezuela, an OPEC country and a competitor to American fracking. Didn't say that. I think that's important disclosure, don't you? If you see the movie Gasland, you will not know that it was made with the cooperation of an OPEC competitor, a dictatorship. But the embassy of Venezuela in Washington, D.C. just couldn't keep their excitement to themselves or their disappointment, so they tweeted. This is a tweet from the embassy of Venezuela. You can find it online today. And it says, sadly, Gasland didn't win an Oscar because a Venezuelan helped make it. And if you click that link, you'll go to the State Film Authority of Venezuela. They, I, I don't think they consulted Josh Fox when they gave away his game. But sometimes they don't even hide it. As you know, Sitgo, is uh, owned by Venezuela. Here is a copy of a letter that they filed with our National Energy Board saying Sitgo is concerned about overbuilding pipeline capacity out of the Canadian production areas. Yes, I'm sure they are. I'm just surprised that they would put that in writing and send that to the National. I, this is a real letter. If you go on the National Energy Board's website, you will find this letter from a state-owned oil company owned by Venezuela writing to the Canadian regulators saying, we don't think you should put more Canadian oil on the market. And, you know, we, we got no, you know, we got no dog in this hunt, but, you know, yeah. I, I mean, that's an incredible letter. That's just, that's an incredible letter. Sometimes they just come right out and say it. Um, a lot of these oil authoritarians uh, have propaganda arms. Uh, Russia today controlled by the Kremlin, Al Jazeera, as I mentioned, owned by the royal family of Qatar. Uh, I, it was fascinating to see their interest in a tiny little town in New Brunswick called Rexton. Does anyone here know Rexton, New Brunswick? I mean, if you're from the Atlantic, maybe you know it. I, I think I know my town. I didn't know Rexton until the riots there, the anti-fracking riots whipped up by the Sierra Club. But in Moscow, at Russia Today headquarters, in Doha, Qatar, they knew this was a big story, and they sent camera crews to Rexton, New Brunswick? Really? That's, that's breaking news in Moscow. Well, yeah, because if the whole point is to denormalize your competitors, I mean, sure, you can write a letter to the National Energy Board, but why not whip up a riot and then magnify that with your state propaganda. Let me show you a video taken by a rider. Now, it's a very quick video, so let me tell you what to look for because it goes by in about five seconds. Do you remember what happened in Rexton? Five police cars were torched by the rioters, and they seized a CTV camera truck because the rioters thought CTV was not reporting on the riot sympathetically enough. Listen to this rioter say who he trusts and who he doesn't trust in the media. Oops, don't fail me now, come on. 
having a cursor problem again. Apparently the, uh, apparently the uh, corporate media, CTV News, and their trucks confiscated. Uh, the only people allowed to make any reports are independent media or Al Jazeera and Aboriginal News, APTN. Did you see the burned out cars right at the beginning? If I can find my cursor here again, I'll play it. Um, it goes by really quickly. Apparently Do you see them there? Do you see them there? And they seized that truck. It's a million dollar broadcasting truck. Al Jazeera. APTN. Let's put them aside, but he knows his friends. Who was reporting it from a pro rider point of view? Al Jazeera, he knew that, and he said that. This is just some rioter. I, I produced a little TV ad making fun of the Saudis a few years ago. It only ran on YouTube, and I think we aired it once on the Oprah Winfrey channel. We scraped together 2,000 bucks, ran it once, just so we could say we did. And I, now this is small print, and I didn't know how to show this to you, but this is an actual email my lawyer received. I'm just gonna read it to you. Mr. Ross, as you are aware, we represent the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. From our telephone discussion, I understand that you represent the Ethical Oil Institute. That was my little NGO. We expect to be contacting Ethical Oil on behalf of our client in due course. In the interim, kindly advise if you have authority to accept service on behalf of your client. Regards, Rahul Agarwal, Norton Rose, one of the largest oil, uh, law firms in the world. So I had a little YouTube video, ran once, on the Oprah Winfrey show, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia hired Norton Rose, one of the largest law firms in the world, to call up my lawyer and say, uh, we're thinking of suing, can we uh, give you the documents? I mean, they're, they're, not even, they're not even pretending. They're not even pretending. You know, oil was up around 110 bucks a barrel, and you'd think the Saudis would love that, but do you remember this interview? Uh, with Fareed Zakaria, a principal lead. Now, here's what he said when oil was 110 bucks a barrel. So, Richard, so do you think prices will come down? Uh, uh, the state vision of Saudi Arabia, we want the price to be between 70 and 80, not only to help the West, but also to help ourselves. Yes. We don't want the West to go and find alternatives, because clearly the, the higher price oil goes, the more you have incentive to go and find alternatives. I, I don't know if you can understand his accent. He says, this was when oil was about 110. He said, we want the oil between 70 and 80, because we don't want the West to go and find alternatives. We don't want them to have an incentive to find alternatives. He was talking about the oil sands and fracking in the United States. Now, he got his wish. Oil fell to 80 to 70 and much lower. But they're not taking their foot off the gas because they know they are bankrupting or trying to bankrupt oil fracking and the oil sands. Why? Because they don't want the West to have alternatives. OK, so they've said that. They're hiring lawyers to threaten people who criticize Saudi Arabia. Uh, they're sending propaganda to uh, romanticize rioters. They're funding propaganda films like uh, Gasland by Josh Fox. We don't know where the money in Tides Foundation originates before it goes to eco-justice to threaten friends of science. And again, I, I am indulging in no conspiracy theories here. I have not said anything that I have not backed up with some document or, or statement. You don't need conspiracy theories when you're talking about OPEC and Russia trying to defend their cartel. It's called a cartel because they are honest with you. The whole point of OPEC is to screw the customer. They are not being coy about it. Let's hear what Anders Fogh Rasmussen, the outgoing NATO chief, said about Vladimir Putin. Russia as part of their sophisticated uh, in information and disinformation operations, engage actively with mm. so-called non-governmental organizations, environmental organizations working against shale gas, obviously, to uh, maintain European dependence uh, on imported Russian gas. That's my interpretation. What, do you think Vladimir Putin uh, lacks the motive to finance Greenpeace or other groups in the UK and France and Poland and Germany that are against fracking? Do you think he lacks the motive? He has an enormous motive because he 
keeps them dependent on Gazprom, and it's not only financial, but it's political dependence. If you doubt that, look at how Putin turned off the gas to Ukraine three times in the dead of winter as a political weapon before invading them. Uh, does Putin lack the motive? No. Does he lack the character to do such a thing? Does he lack the means? Does he lack the history? We only confirmed after the fall of the Berlin Wall that the Soviets were funding the British coal miners unions to keep them in their strike as long as possible against the West. Vladimir Putin is a former KGB agent. These are tactics that he grew up with. This is how he thought, and I put it to you, still thinks. Do you doubt that Russian money through some intermediary way is going to prop up the westernification, the puppets, just like the Rockefeller brothers and the Tides Foundation deliberately say, we must find local champions, we must find aboriginal faces. Do you doubt Putin does it? Do you doubt he lacks the accounting trickery to have money show up via Tides or some other force? Well, don't take it from me, take it from the former NATO chief. Now why? Well, it's so obvious why. Because any barrel not produced in Alberta, any barrel not getting to Tidewater from Alberta is a barrel that must instead be bought from Saudi Arabia or soon Iran or Russia or Venezuela or Nigeria or all these countries instead of from us. And I say again, when was the last time you saw Greenpeace protest against Saudi Arabia, Iran, Venezuela? When was the last time you saw any of that? When was the last time Ecojustice fought against a tanker on the East Coast bearing a Saudi flag rather than one on the West Coast. Isn't it odd? Isn't it odd? The oil sands, what, two and a half million barrels per day? I don't know what it is now. Saudi Arabia, five times that, four or five times that, Russia, four or five times that. Just, just no time, just no time to get around to it. Maybe it has to do with the fact that, well, I mean, why is Russia against fracking? Well, because they have signed a $400 billion China-Russia gas deal, and it's a bit of a race, isn't it? Who could get the natural gas to China first? Well, British Columbia really, really wants to. And that Petronas proposal, what is it, $35 billion, has been reviewed so many times, provincially, federally. And now Gerald Butts, he, he's decided to delay it from some indeterminate time. Who's the winner there? Who's the winner? Well, maybe the guy who's going to get his gas to China first is the winner. I had a friend make up these last two cartoon panels. Let me end on them. I see two choices. I, I made this cartoons for my, for my book on fracking, but I think it applies to, to oil identically. In a world without fracking or without oil sands, the energy tyrants rule. I think that's true. Westerners turn in desperation to break their conflict energy dependence with expensive but unreliable alternatives. That's true. Earth Hour, invented by Gerald Butts at the World Wildlife Found, uh, Foundation. Um, Earth Hour never ends. Lives are colder and smaller, ceaselessly absorbed with conservation and mass transit. The modern Luddites have won, turning our society into one of low-tech reducers, reusers, and recyclers. Well, if you take that mantra at its meaning, reduce, reuse, recycle, it means, yeah, turn off the lights and sit in the dark and colder winters and more. I mean, that's is that not the logical conclusion of reduce, reuse, recycle? So that's one future. That's the energy poverty, de-fossil fuel, de-growth, mad, mad, or you know, de-industrialization proposal. That's that's the Unabomber. That's energy poverty. That's Ontario. Or a future with fracking or oil sands means cheap, plentiful, and clean energy. And if you doubt it, you know, I'd, a fella told me today, and I'm sure he's right, I'd like to see the math on not just carbon emissions, but particulate pollution from this natural or arson-caused forest fire versus the industrial emissions of the oil sands over a year. Which do you think is higher? Which do you think is higher? So a future with fracking and oil sands means cheap, plentiful, and clean energy. The energy price advantage brings manufacturing back home, spurring jobs and tax revenue. That's true. Pennsylvania, just as steel was collapsing, 
fracking took off, 200,000 jobs, and the price of energy for the average Pennsylvania home has fallen by over $1,000. Our cost of living drops, and we export energy to our friends, freeing them from OPEC and Russia's grip. Wouldn't it be amazing if New Brunswick, which sits on shale gas, fracked gas to reduce its own costs, create jobs, and then they shipped gas from New Brunswick to India. It's actually co closer from New Brunswick to India than from Vancouver to India. Could you imagine the industrial renaissance in New Brunswick if they were allowed to frack what's under their feet? Could you imagine how awesome it would be for that first Canadian flagged LNG tanker to pull into India or China or Taiwan or Korea where natural gas is what triple, quadruple what it is here. The, not just the pride, but the liberation of our friends through our ethical energy from the conflict energy they're now importing from OPEC or Russia. And now you see why it is so much in OPEC and Russia's interest not to let us do that. It is a world in which freedom and ingenuity bring a society of plenty. That's what the eco-wackos call techno-fantasy. The rest of us, well, we just call it Alberta. Thanks for your time.